phone I'm on. I'm just tweeting it because nothing is real unless it's been tweeted. And now it has been tweeted. Yay! Uh, we apologize for all the issues last week. Besides my being like a death's door, um, I apparently also infected the equipment and it wouldn't work. Um, so we'll try again and hopefully you're all watching this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. HCTmerch.com. Right? Yes, yes, because we'd, we'd love for you to buy a mug or poster. Go support us on patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Wordy Lane, I'm just going to start. Amanda Treadwell asks, Amber necklaces? I have a few friends recommending these for our teething child. I keep thinking choking and strangulation hazard. Thoughts? My thoughts are you are correct. Um, why? Why? So Amber necklaces. Evidently, they're these like... Uh, that they make like they put the beads on necklaces and kids are supposed to chew on it and evidently as they chewing on it it's supposed to release enzymes or compounds or something oil, oil something that's supposed to soothe bit why no 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 first of all it's like would, would you do you really want your kids gnawing on stuff and just getting whatever seeps out of it that doesn't seem like a good idea plus this is a monster choking hazard you know they, they get they manage to chew off one of those beads or pull it off and they're gonna choke or you're right, they got a necklace on and they could strangle themselves. It's like, we, we don't even want a blanket in bed with babies. That's what we're, but you're gonna give them like a, a, a choker with, with little choking hazards on it? That's insane. And why Amber? I mean, if, you, if your kid's in pain, talk to your doctor. We have medications for that. You know, I'm not suggesting children should be in pain. You know, and sometimes we used to just have them gnaw on uh, frozen things because the cold makes their teeth feel better. I know I'm stealing this from a comedian. I can't remember which comedian, but we used to do like even frozen waffles, and the joke was like that the uh, that the, the indentations like natural natural drool cups to catch the drool. But regardless, no on the amber necklaces. No, 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 no. Do something else that's reasonable. Amanda Cook. <coughs> I apologize. I'm still getting over my flu. It's rough. Amanda Cook asks in the Martian. Um, Mark Watney survives for a long time on just potatoes, water, and vitamins. Probably not a great idea, but is it possible? How long before you'd run into major medical issues? So, from what I gather, um, the author of that book did a lot of research to see, to make this as realistic and believable as possible. And he, I know he actually like talked to botanists and stuff. So I'm going to guess that whatever Mark Watney did, it's possible to survive. Of course, survival is not the same as, you know, happy living. Um... He probably, I'm going to guess that the vitamins took care of, like whatever, like, you know, amino acids he certainly needed or whatever else was extra. You know, the potatoes would work as a source based upon everything else and maybe give him enough carbs to get through. I don't doubt by the time he got off of Mars, you know, he was suffering. Um, but people starve all the time. Um, and at least he was being fed and had some vitamins and water. And so uh, I think it's possible. Hot rhetoric, ass. How do you know when to have a mole checked out? Is it better to get a suspicious mole checked out sooner or can it wait? If you're asking me, you should have it checked out. It seems like a good rule of thumb. If you're worried, then then ask. The you know, best case scenario is that, that your doctor's gonna look at it and be like, no, nah, don't worry about that. You know, on the other hand, it might be concerning. So I would not wait, you know, get it checked out. Again, checked out is the baseline. I'm not saying get it biopsied, I'm not saying get it scanned, I'm not saying run labs or anything else, but you should have at least a doctor look at it or a healthcare provider look at it. Um, and especially I would never tell you to wait considering that I've never seen it and I don't know anything about your history or what it looks like. So you shouldn't be getting advice from YouTube anyway. You should be getting advice from a real healthcare professional as we say every week. Do that. Leah78 asks a book here that I'm gonna summarize. I see quite a few fresh and uh, quite a few questions on Healthcare Triage Live, starting with some sort of diet, drink, supplement, or activity, and ending with the question, is it better for me? At which point I seem to always answer the questions with no, because there are no studies linking those things to positive differences in health outcomes. Leah78's problem is that he thinks or she thinks people don't want to know always about health outcomes, but mood, comfort, energy, you know, softer outcomes and things like that. Then that maybe you'd be less susceptible to all the products that claim to make you feel better. You want to see this addressed. Look. Um, most of the time, I'm addressing the hard out outcomes of health because that's the promises that are being made. And if that's the promises that are being made, I'm going to investigate them. For instance, when I drink hot tea, it's not because Lipton has put an ad out saying it's going to cure my cancer or it's going to improve my diet. It's that I like hot tea and it makes my throat feel better. And we don't need a study for that because there's no harm it's just you're going to do it if you like it and it costs like pennies and that's awesome all the way around 
My problem with all these supplements and diets and drinks and activities is that they're promising the moon. They're not saying, hey, you know, you know, buy this acai berry because it tastes good. Or because you know what, if you like it and you drink stuff you like, you might have a happier life. That's not what the ad says. The ad talks about your antioxidants and your risk of cancer and improves brain health and you're, you're gonna be smarter. Ah, none of that is true. None of that has been proven. So low level stuff like it's gonna improve your mood, it's gonna you know, give you some energy. It's gonna, yeah, yeah, cough, yeah, this improves my energy. But it's not marketed as like a magic woo kind of solution. It's caffeine, it works. And I know exactly what I'm doing and I'm paying exactly the market value for what I think it should be. And I'm overpaying because I went to Starbucks. Um, you know, you could, you could go and get this dirt cheap and still get your caffeine. So it's like, that's the problem. So, and they're not going to be those studies because that's not what they're trying to market on. No, is anyone, anyone disputing this? Always. We should be weighing the harms. We should be weighing the benefits. And if the benefit and the harms are negligible, like none, like, it's a beverage. It's not going to harm you. We know exactly what's in it. There's nothing wrong with it. And the cost is low, So, because even the economic cost can be a harm. If there's no harm, then any benefit you might get from it, even if it's a personal, I like the taste benefit, is going to outweigh the harms. Go, do it. I like some, I like scotch. And it can even cost like 40, 50, 60, $70 a bottle. I'm willing to pay that. But there's no ads out there telling me it's going to make me healthier or promising any kind of things. I just like it. And I'm willing to spend, which is the harm, money on it because that's what it's for me. And I'm not going to sit here and preach that you should do it because I don't know if you'll like it. But, you know, if we're talking about just like local, personal, mood, comfort, energy, things like that, we don't need a study. You know what works for you. You know what you're willing to spend for it. That's where it starts and ends um, if there's no harm. The problem is when they make these claims about gross benefit for everyone, that's where it gets into problems. Um, and that's what we're trying to, to, to dispel here on. These are different parts or pig skin because it most naturally mimics human skin. And then they leave some empty. They use some neosporin. They use some hydrogen peroxide. They use some other stuff. <coughs> neosporin actually results in quicker healing and uh, uh, better scar and everything's sort of better overall than doing nothing because it's better to keep a, a wound moist and covered. And neosporin helps with that. Um, it also has, you know, bacterial, pro you know, antibacterial properties because it's got you know, any bacterials in it. So it's going to, it's going to help you in that respect as well. So yes, now like so much so that you're going to know, you're going to notice monster differences. And I said, every cut has to be covered in Neosporin. No, but you know, if you're going to cover it and if you're going to, you know, cover it with Neosporin to keep it sort of moist and covered and then cover it with a bandaid, that is the way to sort of achieve optimal wound growth. You can do optimal wound healing. You can do that with things other than Neosporin as well. Aloe seems to work with burns and some other things you can do as well, but Neosporin is good. Derek Z00, I'm learning about healthcare and systems in the United States and other creation of Medicare and Medicaid, an enormous impact in hospitalization rates in the US, which also increased reimbursement rates. Um, could you help me understand reimbursement rates and its connection to healthcare costs or hospitals and all this other stuff? So, this is such a big question, we could spend hours on it. So, yes, Medicare, when it was first passed, was demonized by the AMA and many other groups because they thought it was a government takeover of healthcare. They even got Ronald Reagan to produce these like, I guess it's like a podcast that you would call it these days. It was these ads that people would play, you know, on, uh, there was a record and it talked about how it was the end of days station and in doctor salaries in the seventies and eighties. And you know, now that we're trying to slow that down, it's still, we still do an enormous amount of spending in healthcare on Medicare and a lot of Medicare and Medicaid. And some of that is on reimbursement rates, but it's not entirely on reimbursement rates and it is complicated. And, um, as they've tried to slow reimbursement rates in Medicare, doctors are savvy, as are most people when it comes to economics, and they've increased their volume to replace what they were getting on a per item reimbursement. So it's all complicated and difficult, and I, I just can't possibly do it justice in a couple minute question on Healthcare Triage Live. The Trepanier asks, I contacted Chickenpox at the age of three weeks, consequently I've never received the vaccine.
or this makes you this percentage more likely, but it is very likely with most cancers that there is some familial or genetic component, which is why we, and some of these cancers are tied into each other. For instance, on Friday, Healthcare Triage News, we're gonna be covering, so we did some stuff on breast cancer and actually high first, two or two first degree relatives with either breast or ovarian cancer actually leaves you at a higher risk for breast cancer because some of these are even linked together, not just by family, but also by different parts of the body systems. So yes, if your family has a history of skin cancer, you should be at more, have a higher risk. Yes, what is the research on saturated fat forms bad? What amount would be detrimental to health? Go watch our full episode on fats. That's a good start. So here's the thing. These days, we actually do believe that it's like the saturated fat that is that is the best. Well, I say we, meaning I think it's still like, a, you know, most of the nutritional commentariat, nutritional expertise group, the, the establishment, if you will, um, does actually believe it's saturated fat that's the bad thing. We're not still sure... We just aren't positive. It seems like it's linked to high levels of cholesterol and high levels of cholesterol are linked to increased levels of heart disease and blah, 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 and get all the way down the line. But, you know, we don't have a ton of good randomized controlled data that says that this is still the case. And given how we've made so many mistakes on fat in the past, I hesitate to say we know anything for sure in this area at all. I'm trying to write a book. We're getting close. You might think about nutrition and the things that people say are bad for you and aren't because I think this stuff is fascinating. Um, and there's more and more data, the more I look into it, that says we don't know what the hell we're talking about. So we'll see. Vibhav Gupta says brushing your teeth only once. For I, on the other hand, you know, I brush my teeth, but I'm not nearly the zealot that she is. I have one filling in my mouth. One. And I got that because I got braces as an adult in my 30s. And the braces gave me a cavity because I just couldn't get the teeth. But it's like I have like no cavity. My teeth are amazing. It's so just genetics. I hope my kids get my teeth, not Amy's teeth, because because like that's what it is. And there's actually a lot of studies that have shown as kids get cavities, it's often with bacteria that's in their mother's mouths from like sharing spoons and so it's like that's that's where the majority of the danger comes from. Brushing teeth, we don't know. Having said that, mouths are gross and they're dirty. Then anything you can do to help clean that up a little bit will help with breath, will help with your social game, will help with like you know, your overall hygiene, and for that respect, brushing teeth is great. Bad breath is terrible. So, you know, I'm going to err on the side of brushing teeth twice a day, at least. I'm gonna do that, just because it's like, again, what's the cost? Minimal. What's the harm? Negligible. What's the benefit? Good in social aspects, theoretical in terms of preventing cavities and mouth health, probably good for gingivitis too, and also for removal of plaque and tartar, both of which are bad. So, for all those reasons, you should brush your teeth. Last question, sweet chestnut 07, what is the true likelihood of me giving a baby whooping cough if I'm not up to date on my Tdap vaccination? Higher than you'd think these days, because you know, pertussis is actually coming back. Um, and it's bad for babies. I've seen them hospitalized. I've like taken care of babies hospitalized for pertussis. It's bad. It's bad enough that that's why like the, the new recommendations are that every pregnant woman, every pregnancy should get like re-immunized again. Um, I would do it. What's the true likelihood? It's low in the scheme probably of, you know, absolute percentages, but you know, we're again weighing benefits and risks and the harms are real. And when a baby gets pertussis, it's bad and it's hard to treat in kids and adults. It's really hard to treat. Um, and so given that we do lots of stuff in the world to prevent rare occurrences, this is one that's it's gonna work, it's gonna help, and it's a, it, ha it can happen, it does happen. I, I would do this, if you're asking me personally. Like, my family, we would do this. Um, we're not gonna have any more babies, but if Amy was revaccinated, and someday when my kids have babies, and they say to me, you as a grandparent should also be, va I'm gonna get the shot. Because I, I don't wanna, you know, it's, vaccines work. They're awesome, they work, and like, we should do it. All right, we're gonna make this a shorter one than usual, because, my voice is still somewhat shot, and we want to get out on time. We will have no, no live next week, we said? No live show next week. We're going to catch up and watch. You should, catch, you should catch up. Watch some of the older episodes. Big, uh, you know, um, this week's Healthcare Triage was on, like, Kids Are Actually Awesome, and you should watch it, and it's been pretty popular. And you should watch all the episodes of Healthcare Triage. And you should tell other people to watch all the other episodes of Healthcare Triage, because it's awesome. We've sort of plateaued. We need to we need to push. We need to do well. Yay, go. Go watch them. Go watch them again. Tell everybody else to watch them. Share them with your friends. 
Um, check out facebook.com slash healthcare triage. Check out the Reddit site. I got to get back on there. I've been sick and check out what's going on and answer lots of questions. Um, there will be a link in the description to the master question list document if you want to know what we talked about in the episode and where you can go. You should use it. It'll be updated for March this afternoon, I'm told by Mark. Um, Patreon.com slash healthcare triage. We so appreciate your support. It's really important. We actually have some new episodes coming up that we were just talking about that we need to make investments uh, into some really good graphics and stuff like that. And the money to do that kind of stuff comes from your support. We really do appreciate it. Otherwise, thanks for tuning in. Watch Healthcare Triage News on Friday, Healthcare Triage Classic on Monday. No live next week, but we'll be back the week after that. You should tune in. Thanks a lot. Thank you.